Hi, thanks so much for checking out this video today. My name is Alice and I'm going to be talking about ideal gas laws. So before I get into exactly what the laws are, I want to make sure that you know what ideal gases are. So just like their name suggests, ideal gases are not actually real. So they are ideal. They're a figment of your imagination, if you will. And they are actually used to predict the behavior of real gases because real gases have a lot of different nuances that make it really hard to predict what exactly their behavior will be with under a certain set of circumstances. So using ideal gases as a sort of best substitute is the best way to figure out what those real gases are actually going to be like. And some of the characteristics of ideal gases are that all of the molecules do not attract or repel each other. So there are absolutely no intermolecular forces, which, of course, is impossible when you're talking about actual real gases. And uh, any collisions that are made are elastic. And that means that uh, there's no energy lost or transferred in any way. Uh, during any collisions. So if you have two molecules that collide with each other or molecules that collide with the side of the container of your gas, uh, nothing, no energy is going to be uh, released or transferred from one thing to another. Each molecule is always going to have the same amount of energy. Uh, and then molecules, the gas molecules themselves, take up no vol volume. So in the real world, gases take up a really tiny amount of volume, uh, but this is definitely not enough to really make a huge difference. Uh, but when you're talking about really small volumes or really high pressures, then the volume that the molecules themselves actually does come to play. And so when you're talking about ideal gases, you just want to not think about uh, the volume at all. Okay, so just to elaborate a little bit on the differences between ideal and real gases, uh, most real gases behave almost ideally uh, in certain uh, situations, and those are room temperature and atmospheric pressure. So this is really useful because we don't have to actually know exactly what every single real gas is going to do under these situations. We can sort of approximate it with the laws that I'm going to introduce later in this video. Uh, but basically, if you have these sort of normal conditions uh, where you have, you know, just out in the open, in the air, uh, you're going to be able to use uh, the ideal gas approximations. Um, okay, so how they differ is number one, at high pressures. So when you have really high pressures, basically your real volume is going to be higher than your ideal volume. And the reason for that is because um, at high pressures, you have all of your molecules sort of con condensed, compressed into, you know, a really small volume. And when you have uh, your molecules in there, basically um, your ideal gas has no volume for each of its molecules. So none of the molecules have any volume to contribute to the volume of the gas as a whole. But when you're talking about a real gas that does have real volume, uh, the proportion of what the molecules take or the molecules take up in that container becomes higher and higher when you have higher and higher pressures. And so uh, then you really can't just ignore the volume that each of the molecules contributes to the whole. And the other big situation where ideal and real gases diverge are at low temperatures. So at low temperatures, um, the uh, effect of intermolecular forces really comes into play. So when you have low temperatures, basically that means that each of the molecules in the gas are not moving as quickly or with as much energy. So remember that uh, temperature basically is a measure of how much average energy there is 
in uh, in whatever substance you're looking at. So at a low temperature, everything has sort of um, lower energy. Therefore, the molecules, the gas molecules, are moving slower, uh, more slowly, and so when you have intermolecular forces interacting with those gas molecules, uh, the effect of those intermolecular forces, even though they're really small, they're going to be a lot more pronounced just because overall your molecules are moving more slowly. So those are the main ways that ideal and real gases differ. But again, uh, in normal circumstances, they're very, very similar. Okay, so what exactly is the ideal gas law? There are sort of two versions of it, and the first one that we're going to look at is the molar version. So when you have uh, a sample of gas and you are measuring it in moles, you're going to use this equation, which is PV equals NRT. PV equals NRT. So you may also hear this as pervnert or pervnert. Basically, this is an equation that you'll probably use a lot. So R uh, is the constant. And here's a nice little graphic. A lot of these variables can be measured in different uh, different ways. So um, here on the left, you have R with uh, joules, Kelvin, Kelvin and moles. And then on the right, you have the uh, R with uh, liters, atmospheres, Kelvin and moles. So um, that is a really good reference chart uh, that you can take a look at. And then for the other version of the ideal gas law, uh, it's molecular. So this is when you would be looking for um, the concentration or the amount of your gas in the number of molecules. So instead of PV equals NRT, you have PV equals NKT. Uh, so the big N here is the number of molecules. And then uh, the little K with the uh, subscript B that's gonna be your constant. Here are some of the um, units that you can use if you are going to be uh, using this. And there is a way to convert the uh, equations for ideal gases to equations for real gases. So you can take into account some of those uh, differences that I mentioned before with the uh, intermolecular forces and the volume for your, uh, for your real gas. And here's that equation. And you can see it's a little bit confusing, but the variables are basically the same. So the big P stands for pressure. The big V stands for volume. You have the N, which stands for the number of moles. So this uh, only holds for measurements that you have in moles. And then the little A and the little B are constants dependent on whatever real gas you're looking at. So it's going to be a little bit different for every single gas. So you need to look those up in some sort of chart. But basically, it's really intuitive uh, to understand this equation. When you have the P, the real pressure is going to be slightly less than the ideal pressure. Uh, so you need to add a little bit um, in order to use this equation. And then the volume is going to be slightly larger than the ideal gas because your real gas uh, has the molecules, the molecular volume in it. So you need to subtract a little bit from that. Uh, but this is very easy to use as long as you have those other constants, the A and the B, specific again to each gas. Okay. And the reason that this is really important is uh, not only because you can figure out how this all works, but you can actually compare different gases and predict how they're going to behave when different situations change. Okay, so you have PV equals NRT, and if you rearrange that a little bit and assume that the number of moles of gas you have is constant, which usually it is if it's in some sort of like vessel or a container of some sort, then PV over T equals a constant. So when you know that PV over T equals a constant, then you have this. You can change the pressure, volume, or temperature, and then you can predict 
what the other variables are going to be as long as you have you know enough information here so this is a really good new derived formula uh, that you'll probably use a lot to sort of go off of those sometimes specific variables will stay the same and so in those cases you want to you can use a more simplified version of that ideal gas formula Boyle's law is one of those and basically Basically, you use it when temperature is constant and so when temperature is constant PV equals PV so remember in the original formula that we just looked at the PVs were divided by temperature but if they're the same then you can get rid of those and just look at the PV from the initial and the final and the other good law that you can use is called Charles's law so for this, the pressure is constant. So if you're doing something just in like atmospheric pressure and you're not trying to vary it, you can actually just use this. So the pressure is constant, which means that um, the volume divided by temperature for the initial state is going to be equal to the volume divided by temperature for the final state. So this is uh, definitely easy for you to use. All right, so that's it for this video. I will also make one about uh, actual questions that have to do with all of these formulas and equations. So uh, check the description below for that. I do offer all of my slides and other surprise bonus materials for free. The link to sign up for those is down in the description box. So definitely check those out if you're interested. I have some other videos over there. So please check those out. And if this helped you, uh, please share it. That is how other people find my material. So I hope this really helped and uh, have a great day.